Hello and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and developments in Chinese culture, politics, economics, and society. Today on China Forum, we will be discussing U.S.-China military relations. I'm very honored to be here today to serve as the moderator for China Forum's 100th episode, a landmark achievement for our modest television program. As such, we are very excited to welcome Admiral William J. Fallon as a very special guest for China Forum's 100th episode. Admiral Fallon retired from the military in 2008 after a four-decade career in uniform. During his time of service, Admiral Fallon led U.S. and Allied forces in eight separate commands, including U.S. Pacific and U.S. Central commands. Beginning in career aviation, he served in key leadership roles in the military and in diplomatic levels, uh, diplomatic matters at the highest levels of the U.S. government. A graduate of Villanova University, the Naval War College, and the National War College, he received an MA in International Studies from Old Dominion University. Post-military activity has included a year as a Wilhelm Fellow at the MIT Center for International Studies. Admiral Fallon, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, it's my pleasure, Madeline. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Very honored that you're our special guest for our 100th episode. It's quite an honor today. Um, just to begin our conversation briefly today about U.S.-China uh, military relations, would you mind just briefly describing what you would see as the evolvement or development of U.S.-China military relations just within the past, say, 10 years? Uh, sure. Uh, maybe I could lead into that by uh, describing a little bit about my background and how, um, how um, I've had a chance to uh, both observe and to participate in, in uh, relations with China. Uh, back when I was a young officer uh, in the 1960s, we uh, uh, used to routinely uh, steam through the waters uh, close to China, the South China Sea, East China Sea. Uh, during the war in Vietnam, we had uh, quite, a, quite a bit of, uh, of heavy naval activity in particular uh, over in this area. So it became pretty, uh, uh, pretty common to, uh, uh, for U.S. forces to be, uh, be in this region. And of course, we'd uh, been out here since the end, end of World War II. But uh, there wasn't really uh, any interplay uh, between the U.S. and China back in those days, uh, primarily because uh, China was focused internally in the uh, 50s, 60s, uh, up until the 70s. U.S. had been a traditional guarantor of, of stability and security in the region. We have relationships with, uh, with just about every other country, and so we routinely had a lot of forces out there. Um, after the, uh, the opening uh, to China with the, the visit from uh, President Nixon and Henry Kissinger, uh, things began to uh, evolve with the relationship, but the military aspect uh, really stayed uh, on the back burner. There was, it was very, very little. Uh, during the 1980s, uh, some, some cooperation, and uh, that all came to a screeching halt in 89 after the Tiananmen incident. Uh, so the last 10 years, uh, probably um, the way to describe this is a slow thaw in relations uh, then through the 90s, but uh, unfortunate incident that occurred in 91, the collision between the uh, uh, Chinese fighter aircraft uh, and the U.S. Uh, P-3 reconnaissance aircraft, uh, set things back again, and uh, I think the, the best way to describe the relationship has been one of a little bit of progress and then some setback, and we would kind of reset it at a very low level. So uh, I got back into the area in 2005 as the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command, and uh, very high interest in China, of course. I thought it's a, a huge issue for us long term not as a negative thing, but as a, as a priority, uh, our relationship in the U.S., uh, uh, between the U.S. and China. So as I assessed the uh, relationship back then, uh, what I saw was a very low level. And I, would, I, would look, I looked around at other aspects of the <clears throat> of interplay between China and the U.S. and saw very robust activity, a growing economic interdependence and uh, growing political uh, relationships and uh, trade and lots of uh, lots of other things, cultural certainly many visits, but the military was really still dragging and the least developed of any aspect I think of uh, U.S.-Chinese relations. 
So in concert with our policy uh, makers back here in Washington, um, I set about trying to improve that situation. And uh, I would say in summary, it's been a very slow process. We're still way behind the rest of uh, the rest of the Chinese-U.S. relationship, uh, making some progress. Um, there are lots of uh, uh, there's lots of hesitation for for a host of reasons that we might go into. But to characterize the relationship has been uh, certainly lagging the rest of it, um, but uh, slowly um, getting better. Uh, the last uh, couple of years, uh, there's been, um, in my observation, uh, uh, some improvement. Um, we had, uh, we just don't, it doesn't uh, have the characteristics that we, U.S. enjoys with most other countries in the region. Uh, certainly when I was the commander uh, out in, uh, in the Pacific, I could pick up the telephone and, and talk to um, leaders, uh, my counterparts, chiefs of defense in uh, virtually every country in the region, but not China. Yeah. North Korea also, but that's, that's a different case. <laughs> we'll stay away from that one now. But, uh, but we didn't have that, uh, that confidence. And there are probably lots of reasons. Uh, the uh, political background, certainly the history of, of problems and uh, improvement and then fall back down into, into uh, a slow, uh, slow burn. But uh, uh, I am encouraged of late uh, to see that there has been significantly more interaction, certainly at higher levels. It's always been my strong feeling that if, it, if the, the relationship's going to develop, it needs to develop from, from top to bottom. So not just the, the, the senior people having meetings, but uh, to actually have interplay between the, uh, at the various levels so people can uh, get, to, get to know one another. Uh, there is a significant exercise coming up in the U.S. that we're sponsoring, and uh, there is Chinese participation in that exercise, several ships coming over. So I think uh, this, is a, this is a good step. Uh, lots yet to be done in this, uh, in this relationship. So just to expand on what we've talked about briefly, we hear the phrase strategic mistrust a lot to kind of characterize U.S.-China relations, just broadly speaking. Do you think that this is a way, just in your experience, that you would characterize our military relations as well? Well, I think this is really, uh, that phrase uh, is, uh, has its basis in uh, a lot of it in the, in the military relationship or the perception of, of things. I think how this comes about is that um, events will occur and uh, um, people will uh, have an opinion about uh, what this, what's occurring or how it should be interpreted. And uh, I'll give you, uh, give you a couple of examples. So one of my uh, continuing requests of the Chinese side was to be more transparent in what they were doing in their, inside their military. Um, in the U.S., um, most of our military activity is quite open to the public. Uh, we have uh, hearings and debates on the Hill with the Congress uh, to appropriate funds for things. Uh, programs are discussed uh, uh, very uh, openly in most cases and in, in a lot of detail. But uh, it was my um, observation that uh, we knew very, very little about what was going on inside China in regard to the, uh, their military development. And uh, I used to use as an example of uh, how this would be helpful my experience uh, with the NATO alliance um, in the transatlantic uh, connection between Europe and the U.S. So that alliance uh, was founded after World War II uh, um, in one respect to uh, unify uh, the West uh, against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. But it had other aspects that were, that were very, very helpful. And uh, those included a great amount of transparency between the countries of the alliance and what they were doing. And so each country uh, could see on an annual basis uh, where money was being spent in the other countries, uh, what it was going towards, and so it uh, engendered a high degree of confidence amongst the, uh, the allies. And frankly, uh, uh, there were other reasons for the NATO alliance, and, and one of them was to try to foster uh, and grow trust between former 
um, enemies, uh, Germany, France, UK, Italy. Uh, so it served a very useful function. Again, this, this inside ability to look inside the, the books, if you would, uh, I think was very helpful. So we have none of that with China. We have no idea. You see press announcements. Uh, I think things are improving. Uh, when I was in China earlier, uh, last year actually, uh, uh, counterpart shared with me uh, a white paper that uh, was a uh, significant step forward, I thought, on the Chinese side, and at least showing what their thinking was in strategic areas. But uh, this, uh, this mistrust is, uh, uh, I think, on our side, uh, the so-called uh, pivot, uh, as it has been known in, in uh, various uh, transformations here, um, arouses a lot of suspicion, certainly in the military uh, uh, minds in China, or some of the, some of the people. Um, uh, people have uh, things that have been uh, put to me are uh, in a questioning manner our, our relationship with Japan, uh, our alliance with Japan, and, and I take pains to try to explain this in, in terms that I think have been very, very positive for China. For example, this, this alliance, this relationship between the U.S. and Japan, again goes back to the days after World War II. And um, uh, but the terms of this basically uh, set the U.S. as the guarantor of security uh, for Japan. In return, uh, they would not have a, a full military. They would have a self-defense force, very small, which they still do, uh, of the various services. Uh, but the U.S. Would, would basically take care of their strategic security. And as I remind Chinese counterparts in our discussions, this has been very, very important to China's growth and development because it's, uh, it's enabled Japan to focus on economic activity for many decades. Uh, they've been the engine that uh, revitalized uh, Asian economic uh, and trade activity, and in no small part uh, have invested in China back in past decades to help their economic growth and, and development. And so um, there is a longstanding anxiety in China uh, towards Japan, uh, to put it mildly, uh, based on uh, on past experiences between the two countries. Having us uh, in the middle of this, in this strategic relationship to me, has been a very positive thing, and I try to convey that to the Chinese. So, you know, some have the view that they, they look around, they tell me, well, we look around China and we see the U.S. and Korea. I said, well, there's a reason, and I walk through the, the Korean War and the fact that uh, the North, and then and so you go around to each country. So some in China would view this as encirclement, I've heard this. Uh, I look at it in, in a very different light. So um, how do we move forward? And the answer, I think, is to uh, acknowledge that there is mistrust, but to work on these things, to get a dialogue going, and then to take positive steps to allay that, uh, that mistrust. And again, it's, uh, it's moving forward in, in areas uh, other than the military pretty quickly. We have a lot of work to do with the mill-to-mill -mill relationship. So just an, a question that just comes to my mind listening um, to your insights is the fact that we have, I mean, our involvement in the Pacific area, like we've just talked about, dates back to the Korean War in Korea, to World War II with Japan. So it's not a new thing that we have such a huge presence in the Pacific. Is it a new thing that China is very distrustful of this, or is this, have they always been very suspicious of why we're so involved in the Pacific? Or is it perhaps kind of heightened recently because of the rebalance? I think that, uh, first of all, the U.S. has had an interest in the Pacific for uh, um, going back a uh, century and a half, mm -hmm. uh, demonstrated by our uh, economic outreach uh, and missions to opening to Japan and China back in the, in the mid-19th uh, mid century. Um, I think that uh, one of the big reasons things are different now is that uh, after uh, Chinese internal focus in uh, the 50s, 60s, 70s, as uh, China began to become more of an economic power and to, uh, uh, to grow and develop, uh, there's kind of a natural um, opening to start looking around in the neighborhood. And uh, of course, there are other, lots of other factors, the, the uh, economic activity in the oceans, the uh, resource potential undersea and in the inshore waters, the, uh, 
uh, continental shelf, uh, economic zones, and focus on those kind of things. Uh, so I think it's been a natural progression for China to be looking out. And again, back I look back uh, when I was a young officer, we would routinely go very, very close to China with our ships, uh, not even paying much attention to China. We had other, other interests. Um, and the Chinese had little interest in us um, because they were focused in other, other areas. That's changing now. So they are very interested in their near near zones from the maritime standpoint. They're very interested in their economic zones, and uh, and the fact that they uh, have that interest, uh, they now have resources. Uh, they have uh, a navy and an air force, for example, that are much uh, much larger and uh, and uh, have uh, uh, they call a uh, blue water navy that actually gets out in other places of the world, and so uh, that dynamic is changing. Uh, the U.S. Uh, I believe because of our tremendous interest and our ties in this region, uh, not planning to leave at all. We, we are very, very interested in, in uh, this area. Uh, we want to keep it secure and stable. That's our primary military interest in this region. Uh, we have longstanding alliances. We'd like to keep those alliances. Good fences make good neighbors. They're not really fences against China. They're relationships with these countries to help them to provide better security for their people. And we're willing to work with any country, in every country, particularly China, in this region. So I think it's uh, the dynamic here is one of change, which is constant. Um, we have uh, certainly enduring interests in both countries. And uh, I believe that uh, adjustments are in progress. Uh, how those adjustments are perceived, uh, the other issues that come up, the flashpoints of the uh, the islands and the, and uh, that are claimed and counterclaimed in the in the near seas of China are uh, continuing uh, points of friction, um, and those friction points come up against this background of larger change. China's focus externally, U.S. interests in the area, and uh, the reset, if you would, to Asia. A lot of politics here, I think in uh, trying to get the U.S. Uh, and its uh, electorate uh, focused away from the Middle East uh, back several years ago. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe could have been and should have been handled a little, little less clumsily in the execution, but the enduring thing is we have a huge interest in the Asia-Pacific area. Uh, we have tremendous uh, economic and political and, and uh, other ties to the region that are continuing to grow. And so we're going to be very focused in this area, as is China. The key will be working with this dynamic and change to figure it out and to move forward in a positive way. So it feels like, especially recently, there are a lot of rising tensions in the region with the East China Sea, the South China Sea. Um, but of course, we hope that positive U.S. mill with China relations can continue to develop. So set against the backdrop of all of these tensions, what are some ways that you think we can continue to develop this positive relationship? Well, most importantly, expanding the, the range and depth of interaction, in, in my uh, opinion, is the most important thing. Um, I found that people the world over uh, share uh, many things in common. Uh, they have a desire uh, to uh, uh, live in a safe and secure environment. Uh, this security begins very close to home uh, with family and neighbors and, and uh, towns and regions. And uh, when you get people to sit down and talk to one another, uh, these things come out, these common interests. And so if you never engage with other people, then you are uh, drawing uh, uh, opinions uh, that are not based on experience and fact. And you start making assumptions uh, that uh, that are based on what you hear rather than what you what you know, and so it's important to have exchange and, and interaction. Um, I mentioned earlier that we are pushing, certainly from my perspective, we would push to have uh, a much more in-depth relationship in in exercises, um, not just an occasional drop in. A group goes and meets somebody at a school or a, one of the war colleges or, or something but actually have more interaction on day to day. Actual, from my past ship visits, uh, actually going to, uh, the, to the other country and, and having the ships visit, have their sailors 
uh, get off the ships and mix with people, let people see them. And this puts a, puts a human face on it. And then the other thing is that for the leaders, the leaders have to act like leaders. Uh, this does not mean um, allowing the uh, media to shape uh, the relationship, which unfortunately occurs, uh, I think, all too frequently. The future should be shaped by the leaders, taking positive steps to interact with one another and to set out goals and objectives to move forward. And uh, there's, there are always going to be flashpoints. There are going to be frictions that will arise. There are going to be incidents that occur, just the human dynamic. But uh, you need to have a framework for dealing with them. A specific thing that was done, I believe, in a very positive sense just recently, uh, there was a, a conference that's held uh, uh, periodically in the Western Pacific amongst the navies. And at that conference, uh, there was an agreed um, uh, pact uh, that would govern uh, um, what would be called uh, unplanned encounters. So two ships that come across each other in the open sea uh, from one of the other countries, uh, U.S. and China or, or uh, Japan or uh, uh, Korea or, or whomever, and so uh, instead of what do we do next, there's actually a, a uh, framework for interaction so that people aren't surprised. There's an expectation that each party will act in a certain way. And that's a, that's a good foundation. And I think uh, these are the kinds of steps that will uh, slowly move us in the right direction. Kind of like contingency planning almost. It's, not, it's more than that. This is actually uh, at a tactical, very tactical low level. It's an expectation that when you see uh, a warship, for example, from, a, from another nation, it's not, uh, okay, what are they going to do now? Uh, what you'd expect to see is a signal that goes back and this is the name of the ship, this is where we're headed, uh, who are you, and uh, anything we can do for you. It's, it, it's, a, it's a common, common uh, courtesy uh, engagement. But the biggest thing is that there's a prescribed a way in which the ships and the navies would interact. And so it's not left up in the air. And so the individual ship commanders will, will know how they're supposed to behave. And that's uh, in an era of uncertainty or an area of uncertainty, it, it puts some structure that I think is very useful. So if we're talking about one of the ways we can develop positive relations is by this interaction and this practical contact where we visit um, their navies or they visit us. I know recently um, our Secretary of Defense Hagel has been over to China several times and has, you know, toured their aircraft carrier and had meetings with high officials. And I'm wondering, have has China or has his counterpart come to the United States and had similar experiences where he gets to, you know, observe our naval operation? Yes, uh, certainly have. In fact, last year, um, the uh, head of uh, Admiral Wu, the head of the Chinese, uh, the PLA Navy, uh, came to the U.S. Uh, at the behest of Admiral Greener, his counterpart here, and, uh, and brought a delegation of, uh, of officers and they toured our ships. I know they went to San Diego, they came here to Washington, they had meetings, got to meet and see, see our sailors. Um, when I was uh, fortunate to be in China uh, representing the U.S. China Policy Foundation. In fact, just last month, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, Minister of Defense, uh, General Shang, and uh, he uh, relayed to me that he had just come back from the U.S., uh, where he had a meeting here in Washington with, uh, with Secretary Hagel. And so those, uh, those things are ongoing. I would like to see the, the breadth and depth of these things increase so that we work down into, uh, into the ranks and get more exposure for, uh, for more people. And so how do you think we should consider the fact that this is the first year that China will be participating in the RIMPAC exercise? I know in previous years China has been invited, but I know last year or in 2012 they declined the offer mm -hmm. saying that it was you know, the United States plan to contain China, so they didn't want to participate. But now they seem to feel like it is something they want to participate in. Well, I think it's a great sign. And, uh, you know, the rhetoric, the containment thing, you have all these terms that, that buzz around. And, of course, again, the media hypes them because it's, hey, let's go talk about it. Let's get excited, you know. And, and uh, you know, it seems like a negative story always sells uh, quicker yeah. than, a, than, a, than the, the opposite kind. 
So uh, when I was the commander in Pacific, I invited the Chinese to come observe uh, one of our very large fleet exercises, which they did. They accepted it. And I think this is, uh, and we did have a, a small exchange, a small Chinese uh, task group of a couple ships actually came to, uh, to the U.S., uh, stopped in Hawaii and, and came to the west coast of the U.S. Um, but this will be the first time for RIMPAC. RIMPAC's a big deal because it involves uh, countries from, as the name implies, the rim of the Pacific, virtually, uh, virtually every navy in the, in the Pacific. Right? Yeah, quite, quite, quite a large group. So it's a, uh, um, it's a uh, done in the waters around Hawaii. It brings everybody together, kind of in mid-Pacific. And it's a good step forward. And the fact that the Chinese uh, uh, leaders have seen uh, fit to uh, accept the invitation is the kind of step that we need to see. And it's like, uh, again, just, just a few years ago, things like this uh, meeting, uh, annual meeting in Singapore, uh, the so-called Shangri-La Dialogue, um, we had no Chinese representation. Uh, I, I would ask from my side. I know uh, secretaries of state and defense would send messages and ask the Chinese to come. They, they declined to come. But of late, they've been coming. The representation has been slowly increasing from lower level to higher level. So each of these things is a good step, and this is what needs to continue. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to extend the offers. They need to be accepted, in my opinion, and then meaningful things have to happen so that people get comfortable and they're not making assumptions about what people are doing based on lack of knowledge. They're actually seeing and the message we would hope people take away is they're not too unlike us and they have a lot of the same goals and objectives and desires and wouldn't it be a lot smarter and a lot better if we cooperated in these things rather than going at each other. It's much too important. The stakes are much too high for us to do anything other than to uh, expand these things and cooperate. So it's a great sign and look forward to hearing about it. So it sounds like despite the tensions in the region, we have a lot to be encouraged by. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of potential. And you look at the, um, from my perspective, the, the stakes, if you would, the, uh, what's really uh, important uh, to my mind is the, uh, first of all, the number of people. So the populations of the two countries. Um, you look at the uh, activity, the interaction, interdependencies that exist between the countries, particularly economically, in the economic sphere, and the, uh, the reality of uh, the, our world. It is so connected. Information is constantly going back and forth. The key thing is, what information? Is the information based on fact and experience? or is it based on conjecture or fear or distrust or all the ne negative terms? And again, um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but <laughs> lead leaders need to lead. Uh, that's what they're supposed to be doing. And so take the initiative, shape, shape the future, shape the interactions, and I think we'll be, uh, we'll be better off. But. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. But I would like to again just thank Admiral Fallon for joining us today and helping us think about U.S.-China military relations. And I, for one, feel very encouraged um, by the perspectives and insights that were given today. And thank you, all of you joining us from home. We'll see you next time on China Forum.